Okay, uh, working again from what in these two books, uh, I'm going to look at this one, um, essay by Paul Ricoeur, Hermeneutics and the Critique of Ideology, uh, picking up from where I left off <clears throat> in the recording I made uh, before, now looking at hermeneutical reflection on critique, remembering that hermeneutical is, is a reference of the law to Gadamer, and critique to critical theory, um, in this instance represented by perhaps its most um, influential representative, uh, Habermas. So hermeneutical reflection on critique should be heard in terms of Gadamerian reflection upon Habermas, um, or upon critical theory. So he's going to um, work here. Uh, I'm going to go into the four subsections. What I'm going to do is just read some key paragraphs and then comment on them quickly. His four points kind of interpenetrate, uh, so, so we will we'll have some overlap, which I'm going to try to avoid uh, by keeping things brief and then giving a summary statement um, in the end. So, so um, number one, uh, the theory of interests. And, and what he asks here is, um, uh, it may be asked what authorizes the following theses that all foreshown or in inquiry is governed by an interest which establishes a prejudicial frame of reference for its field of meaning. That there are three such interests, now not one or two or four, namely the technical interest, the practical interest, and the interest in emancipation. And, and then he goes on. The, the point he's making here is, um, if what hermeneutics is, 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 is now not just a theory of interpretation, but a theory after Heidegger, and it's important to recognize that what makes Gadamer distinctive in Gadamer is, is that he's, he is engaging hermeneutics after Heidegger. When you have a turn from hermeneutics, it's kind of a species of epistemology applied to text, to a recognition uh, after Gadamer that with hermeneutics, we're asking the fundamental question of the sort of beings whose being is partly to um, uh, exist in the sphere of understanding. And hermeneutics is about that understanding, in, in which case hermeneutics becomes um, not just a theory of interpretation on a, is, you know, an aspect of the epistemological plane, but uh, an ontology, um, which, is, which is deeper, which inquires more deeply um, into the character of our understanding, then does epistemology, which it turns out um, presupposes all sorts of things um, as premises which it shouldn't, which allows it to make its claim to universality and objectivity and, and all the rest that, that, that are at the heart of the quest for certainty and the conviction that that's a possible quest um, of the modern epistemological project. Uh, hermeneutics is to go in deeper than that. Uh, Habermas, though, is uh, saying that he is uh, free of hermeneutics, that he's not working uh, within this um, realm. In other words, Habermas, Habermas at, at this point especially, is still uh, questing after that epistemological objectivity, that place to locate um, and anchor his thought. Uh, and and what Gadamer, or what Ricoeur is just pointing out here is he can't delineate uh, these interests um, without um, them being, uh, without substantive historical understanding. In other words, what leads him to name these interests and not other interests, and the reason there's three and not two or four, and the reason they're named this way, the answers to all of those questions will inevitably be a product of his analysis of concrete historical hermeneutical uh, developments in, in, the, in the immediate past. Now, Ricoeur is not contesting the usefulness or even the correctness, um, and neither need uh, Gadamer, of, of naming these interests. This may be a very productive way to parse out the, the character of interests which dictate knowledge. And of course, in, in connecting knowledge and interests in this way, uh, Habermas is undercutting the idea um, and participating in the undercutting of the idea that there's an objective, dispassionate interest, a universal point of view from which, you know, this ideal of the Enlightenment, this is where we can think from and reason from. We're, we're, we've escaped history. We've escaped the, the, the prejudices of our 
uh, customs and traditions and standard authorities. This is this is um, this undercuts the this undercuts. Uh, this is where this kind of gets complicated. This undercuts the prejudice against prejudice because you realize there's no escaping that sort of conditioning and 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 still naming these three interests within that might be uh, quite powerful so so Ricor is not critiquing these interests in this section he's just pointing out that that all of this work uh, that Gadamer is doing uh, is working within the bounds of of what hermeneutics uh, discerns as the uh, inevitable uh, um, structures and and um, concrete uh, flows of understanding which which give us our present thought there's just no way around and around of that uh, so so that's 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 what he's saying when there's not two and not four but these three and why these three and how you identify them the answers to all of those questions are unanswerable if you pretend that, that you're not working within the reign the realm of hermeneutics of the history of understanding um, and this is why, in the end, uh, he's going to conclude this section, not with a rejection, but say, hence I'm quite willing to say that the critique of ideology raises its claim from a different place than hermeneutics, namely from a place uh, where labor, power, and language are intertwined, uh, but the two claims cross on common ground. The hermeneutics of finitude, that's the common ground, the hermeneutics of finitude, that we cannot escape our thrownness into a perf particular place um, in 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 understanding in, in, in thought uh, and understanding um, the hermeneutics of finitude, which secures a priori the correlation between the concept of prejudice and that of ideology, where um, in this sense the concept of prejudice will include both prejudgments, uh, which with the classical example or with um, the notion of recognition, uh, there's a place for affirmation for Gadamer, um, but but also prejudice in still the negative sense of simply by predisposition, right? That just I always was racist. That's how I was raised to be, and not questioning that, um, or which of course I'm saying is bad, right? Um, or uh, um, uh, precipitation, uh, drawing conclusions too too quickly. I mean, those are two sorts of prejudice, two dimensions of what it means to be prejudiced, which Gadamer too wants to um, reject. Um, and those will be linked to the notion of ideology, um, in, in, in particular predisposition, where predisposition might come up real close uh, to what Gadamer is talking about in the classical example. In other words, the idea with the classical example that certain ideas, certain understandings um, have established themselves as not being simply the products of a tradition and a place because over time they've proven out right they've been recognized as especially wise um, or true um, in multiple contexts in multiple traditions that's how the, again Gautama tries to get something that transcends the prejudices of the moment um, it doesn't escape um, history but somehow transcends within the realm of history any particular place. Um, that gives you the affirmation of a hermeneutics of trust with the classical example. Um, it, 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 what Habermas is suspicious of, so where labor, power, and language are intertwined, those are points at which, because of the way those intertwined relations work, um, the, the labor, power, and language, the very language we think, the very rationalities we use, may be formed unwittingly, right? It's not someone's decision, uh, it's not a plot, it, 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 but in ways which will naturally, our rationality, our language forms in ways that naturally privilege some over others. And it could be that those privileges will be common across cultures, and so the classical example will carry uh, notions or ideas which transcend their local place, um, and are, are, are found across cultures and across traditions. Uh, and, and for Gadamer, that becomes, you know, kind of de facto a, a, a basis for affirmation. Uh, but what if we're talking about sexism, which has per per pervaded virtually um, all cultures throughout history and across time, right? Sexist ways of language, which are betrayed even in this text. When Ricoeur keeps talking about man and, and he as these generic references to all humans, but 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 references which 
have been used in such a way that they have shaped understanding in such a way that the male, the man, becomes normative. Uh, so that that is a, an example of a systemic distortion, which Gadamer's appeal to the classical example and in the sort of a hermeneutics of, of, of trust um, is is going to be poorly placed to be alive to. Um, and, and that's a sort of systemic distortion, so that would then become an ideology. Uh, but but the, the point is, is that the understanding, everything I've just talked about, doesn't escape the range of hermeneutics. It, it just alerts us to a certain conservatism, a certain affirmation of the status quo, which is uh, built into sort of the attitude of hermeneutics. So this really gets sort of um, nebulous, and I'm not sure in the end it's actually... Uh, fair to Gautamer, and I'll explain more about that in a second, but but let us end that as point one. Uh, so, so point one is, in terms of the Gautamerian reflection on critical theory, or Habermas, um, concretely, all of what Habermas does is deline delineations of these various interests and not others, um, and the, all the examples he uses, they're all going to come from within history. Uh, he, he Otherwise, he's going to the, the, the modern point of the God's eye view of, of objective, dispassionate, universal reason, which which itself is something critical theory has critiqued, because that notion of reason in Western Europe authorized uh, the contemporaneous colonial project by which Europeans could go out and judging objectively and dispassionately, supposedly, right, in, in you know this way. I mean, that's what interest and knowledge relationship is. There's not dispassionate disengaged universal reasoning, objective reasoning, all our reasoning and thinking is linked ineluctably to some interest or another. That, and again, that ideal, that European ideal, allowed Europeans in these centuries where that was the ideal to go around the world and justify the colonial project because they supposed, um, and this is at the heart of, of enlightenment, right? So this is the dialectic of enlightenment. This is the shadow side of enlightenment, the side which is ideology. This is exactly what Horkheimer and Adorno in critical theory is built on, in particular this example of, of the way in which this notion of objectivity uh, authorized the colonial project. Because it wasn't just Europeans with their cultures uh, judging other cultures by their standards, it was Europeans judging purportedly by universal standards other cultures <clears throat> to be more primitive, more savage, uh, to be, they put themselves in a place to judge, not as Europeans, but as people who had access and thought from a point of a God's eye view with their universal, objective, dispassionate knowledge. Okay, so, so that's kind of the heart of, of, of critical theory, and that way very suspect, very suspicious of even what is seen as the heart of what's celebrated in modern rationality, the, the, the heart of, what it, of, of the Enlightenment project. That's the depth to which critical theory is critiquing. Um, again, though, all of that, all that critique, everything I just said, falls within the realm of hermeneutics. Uh, Gadamer could say all of that, uh, too. Nonetheless, there's a way in which one might think that Gadamer's uh, emphases, the way he brings up the classical example, the overall tone of the book, uh, when you read Truth and Method, it, it does tend to favor the status quo. It does tend to find ways to affirm tradition. Now, of course, it's reacting against the radical opposite of that. And in that sense, it's very, you know, the, this notion of the objective, dispassionate, God's eye view, and relating truth to that and method as as that uh, move to the Enlightenment. So, so Gadamer's book is actually, in that sense, um, uh, supporting and enabling of the critique of ideology. Um, but nonetheless, uh, the, the, it's fair enough to say there's maybe that spirit permeating in the book. But but Habermas hasn't escaped. This takes us to number two. So And let me read this paragraph, this first, first paragraph, which kind of reflects what we've talked about, what I just was talking about. Um, we have sharply contrasted the positions of the critical social sciences, which, remember, are, are, are defined by their interest in emancipation, and the historical hermeneutical sciences, which are, uh, again, in the interest of communicative, um, um, well, communicative interest. Uh, let's see, is that all it's named? Yeah, communicative action. Um, you know, how we develop our societies, our laws, our customs, our traditions, how we, how we structure ourselves as a people so that we can endure over time. Um, that, that would be uh, 
the historical hermeneutic sciences on his. The latter, <clears throat> that is the historical hermeneutical sciences, inclining towards recognition of the authority of traditions, right? That, that's that Godmarian feel, rather than towards, as in the critical social sciences, revolutionary action against oppression. Those are the two trajectories. Uh, but this is the question hermeneutics addresses to the critique of theology here, which accuses it of not being emancipatory, not being emancipatory, um, not being revolutionary enough is, uh, from where um, are you naming these distortions concretely? What's your concrete vision of the distortions? And what's your concrete vision of the new society? So, so Habermas uh, is a, attempts to, again, get to some uh, transcending sort of a God's eye view uh, by projecting <clears throat> an ideal sphere of undistorted, uncoerced communication. As you imagine that sphere, that gives you a standard over and against which to judge the distortions of the present, the oppressions of the present, right? So, so I mean, this is where Habermas uh, is making appeal similar to Gadamer's. And, and, and both of them are kind of trying to figure out how in the world do we get norms, norms back in once we have recognized that all understanding is historically conditioned, that there's no God's eye view, um, and even if there say, say even if there was a God revealing things in history, our understanding of those things is still ruled by this contingency, right? So it, even if you have an understanding of a literal God dictating things to people to write down, right? Still, what's written has to be written down in that language, in that time, in accord with that understanding. And as people read back to that to get that word, I mean, and I'm saying, let's say, for the sake of argument, that literally this is God, you know, straight kind of uh, verbal dictation theory, writing things down. You don't escape any of these contingencies. Th that God still, even if God is speaking from a literal God's eye view, once that God's going to communicate to someone in language, then all that revelation, even if you take it in the most literal sense, is constrained to the time and understanding and language and contours of that day. And then as we read back, if that's there, then all of our interpretation is likewise constrained, not only by the interpretations of that day, but everything that's happened since, right? So, so there's, there's, for both of them, no way out of this, um, the, the historical. No way to get beyond the historical, even if there's literally a God, which I don't think either of them think there actually is. But the point I'm making is, is even if you add that in, it, it doesn't change the fundamental dynamic. Insofar as an idea is interesting and complex, then these uh, dynamics uh, take hold in, in, a, in a powerful way for both of them. So, <clears throat> So, uh, this ideal sphere of unconstrained, undistorted communication, uh, what's it look like? Who's there? What do they look like? What concretely are the characters of an emancipatory existence? Uh, the, the, the point is, is that to answer all of those questions, any of those questions, to give this regulative ideal, this imagined kind of um, sphere of undistorted, com um, uh, undistorted communication, any real content which can meaningfully be used in the present, you're going to have to fill it in with ideas which come from the present. So it, the, 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 the hermeneutics reigns there as well. Um, or else you end up doing another way, it just becomes an alternative way of imagining that old God's eye view of modernity. Um, <clears throat> so, um, uh, so uh, let me read this key paragraph, uh, now like three paragraphs into this section. So the interest, can the interest in emancipation be treated as a distinct interest, separate from uh, the interest in community of action, of, of, uh, of the interest in her, the, the hermeneutics? Um, can it be, can the emancipatory be carved out? And, and what I've just said is, well, of course it cannot, uh, because it needs all of these concrete forms uh, in order to imagine other possibilities. Um, and this is why he says next, it seems not, especially if one considers that taken positively as a proper motif and no longer negatively in terms of the reifications which it combats, right? So um, this interest has no other content than the ideal of unrestricted and unconstrained communication. 
In other words, it can be used as this idea to critique the present, and so it's, it, because it's just critiquing the present, its, its need of present realities to give it content uh, can remain inversible. If you try to just say positively what it is without any of the hermeneutic historical sciences, you realize it's completely empty. Um, and and so, so the interest in emancipation would be quite empty and abstract, I'm quoting again here, if it were not situated on the same plane as the historical hermeneutic sciences, that is, on the plane of communicative action. But if that is so, can a critique of distortions be separated from the communicative experience itself, from the place where it begins, where it is real, and, and it, where it is exemplary? The task of the hermeneutics of tradition is to remind the critique of ideology that man, okay, and, and note again this ironic systemic distortion permeating this essay, right, um, that man can project his emancipation and anticipate an unlimited and unconstrained communication only on the basis of the creative reinterpretation of cultural heritage. So what you're going to do is, is not uh, have some concrete sphere, because there's no, nothing to it, uh, out of this abstraction. But what you're really doing is you're taking other, other um, aspects of the tradition uh, that, that give you ideas of liberation, give you ideas of emancipation, give you ideas of what should be, and you're putting them and in, and in, 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 in using them to critique current dominant power structures. Um, and so, so again, Record nor neither Record nor Gadamer are concretely against Habermas's concrete objections about the character of oppression. Right. So they would all uh, be in one accord with regard to the problems of the colonial project and the way in which it allowed um, um, particular uh, European, Western European powers uh, to dominate other uh, powers and have a justification in play um, which was related to the ideals of reason of the day. Um, so they're all going to be uh, agreed on this. It's, the question is, is, how are we doing that? And of course, how do we recognize that vis-a-vis -vis the present? Uh, vis -a -vis, uh, distortions today, which may be um, uh, problematic and difficult to see because they're built into the rationality, which is systemically distorted in such a way that, that the way we think um, in itself tends to cover over uh, the distortions which are oppressive. So, distortions can be criticized only in the name of a consensus which we, a different consensus, right, which we cannot anticipate merely emptily in the matter of a regulative idea unless that idea is exemplified and one of the very places of exemplification of the ideal of communication is precisely our capacity to overcome cultural distance in the interpretation of works received from the past. In other words, as it's in contrast, what gives us some way out of being trapped within the confines of our own current way of seeing things, what might give us access to alternative visions over and against which we can judge our current understanding are our, our texts from the past or, or texts from, uh, you know, cross-cultural texts that are uh, coming from other traditions, which, of course, those texts in terms of, uh, in terms of you know, being classic and established will also be rooted um, in the past. But that's where the, the productivity of distanciation comes in in a powerful way. All right. So, um, let's see. Uh, that brings us to point three. All right, so picking up on uh, point three, um, the abyss which seems to separate simple misunderstanding from pathological or ideological distortion. He says he wasn't going to continue on that, um, but to talk about another aspect of Habermas's work, which I think I'll follow up here too to uh, make clear. So um, it's the uh, modern, the, the um, dominant ideology of the day, the systemic distortion that, that Habermas sees is the ideology of science uh, and technology, 
Um, so that the, the purpose is um, leg legitimization of the relations of domination and equality, which are necessary for the functioning of the industrial system, which, but which are concealed beneath all sorts of gratifications provided by uh, the system. Um, and if he says, granted this description of the modern ideology, what does it signify in terms of interest? It signifies that the subsystem of instrumental action has ceased to be a subsystem and that its categories have overrun the sphere of communicative action. So what does that mean? So remember, international inter instrumental action is uh, related with the uh, interest in the technical interest in the empirical analytic sciences. Um, the practical interest is what's related to communicative action and the historical hermeneutical sciences. And then emancipatory interest um, is what's related to the projection of the regulatory ideal and the critical social sciences. So what, what Ricoeur has just done has, has been to um, take apart that radical distinction between the practical and the emancipatory interest and say, you know, the emancipatory interest is not something completely distinct. It's rather within the historical hermeneutical um, plane, within the plane of communicative action. You have both um, uh, uh, affirmations of, of structures which tend to uh, conserve the status quo and, and, and speak to, to on, ongoing order, um, but which are weak in critiquing systemic distortions. And then you have other traditions, but these are other trajectories within history, right? So not some discrete interest, something discrete from the historical hermeneutical realm of, and, and of communicative action, um, but, but discrete trajectories within it, which are uh, emancipatory and give us a vision of, of the societies which are more just. How to justify that more, right? How to get away from the contingency I talked about before, that remains an open question, which is never resolved uh, here. Uh, but nonetheless, when he says what this ideology signifies is the subsystem of instrumental action has ceased to be a subsystem, and its categories have overrun the sphere of communicative action. Um, what he means is, is that now, within the historical hermeneutical sphere, within how we order ourselves as a society, uh, the technical interests have taken hold, um, and uh, they become their own justification. So, um, I guess maybe a, a one concrete example of this would be um, uh, something I've discussed before, and that is the... Um, the fact that for corporations incorporated in Delaware, which is where a, um, I believe a majority of the world's Fortune 500 companies are uh, located, th by, by law, then, uh, those corporations, which in the U.S., by the way, legally qualify as persons, um, those corporations are by law not allowed to prioritize anything above shareholder interest. That means prioritizing, um, nothing can be a higher priority, priority than generating profit. Uh, and this doesn't specify profit for whom. That's the sense in which it's not the justification of oppressing class. Um, it's, it's empty in, in that respect, although certainly some people profit over others. But the, the point is there's no group of people who uh, transcend the system. Um, even those, for instance, who are at the top of corporations are not free to determine how they want to order things. They must order things uh, so that profit is maximized over any other value. So uh, treatment of workers, uh, concern for the environment, uh, concern for the future health of, of humanity, um, concern for what is fair in international relations, concern, all those concerns, none of them are allowed to trump uh, the concern for uh, shareholder, increasing shareholder value by law. That's what they're responsible for doing. That's a place, so, so 
and and that means now that the, in terms of, especially since those corporations as citizens have the right to lobby um, and to advocate for their interest um, in a sense we've created uh, these incredibly powerful super persons um, who are not real people but corporations and have global dominance um, and and they then um, are, are by law to advocate for what maximizes uh, shareholder value. So all the goods that would be a product of emancipatory um, interests, or even um, the practical interests in commutative action, all then become subject to technical interest, instrumental action, and the empirical analytic uh, sciences. Uh, perhaps you've been caught in conversations with people as you're appealing something that's happened with you and a company, um, and you have a sense you don't want to get upset with the person, even though something has been done wrong, because no one you're talking to actually has the power to have done anything different. Uh, this would be a way in which the communicative uh, sphere has been distorted in such a way that there's, there's no way to attack or subvert a technical interest in um, the sheer uh, perfection of, of the system. Um, so this is the way in which, another way pe people often say it is, is that the, the, the life world, as another kind of name people use for talking about the sphere of community of action, has been colonized by the technical uh, sphere such that uh, maximizing um, uh, uh, profit becomes the overriding value over and against uh, defeating all others. No other can trump it. That's what, uh, that's what he's talking about here. Um, so, um, so granted that, that ideology today consists in disguising the difference between the normative order of communicative action and bureaucratic conditioning. Otherwise, in other words, when you talk to the salesperson, he's not really in control because things are being done in a way that's not good or that's unfair or uh, that's unjust. I mean, clearly unjust. But but no one you're talking to has the power. The, the thing to realize is no one has that power. Even if you get up to the executive branch, they are dictated by rules. They're placed there in, in accord with their ability uh, to follow and willingness to follow rules, which, which are... Um, um, uh, um, or that's what the bureaucratic conditioning is, is a reference to. It, those are indexed to uh, that maximizing of the efficiency of, of the system and maximizing of profit. Um, that's what that's talking about there. Hence, in dissolving the sphere of interaction mediated by language into the structures of instrumental action, how can the interest in emancipation remain anything other than a pious vow, save by embodying it in the reawakening of communicative action itself, and upon what will you, uh, and upon what will you concretely support the reawakening of a communicative action, if not upon the creative renewal of cultural heritage? Um, which this is what brings us then to that fourth point, where he says. Uh, And this kind of recapitulates the prior points. What appeared to be the most formidable difference between the hermeneutical consciousness and the critical consciousness, the first we said is towards a consensus which precedes us, and the other an anticipation um, of a, a future freedom in the form of a regulative idea, which is not a reality but an ideal, the ideal of unrestricted and unconstrained uh, communication. Again, that ideal is too empty to be effective. This is not a thing. What he wants, uh, Hermeneus will say, from where do you speak when you feel this uh, self-reflection, um, if not the place you've denounced as, as a non-place? So what it is is another tradition um, that's in opposition to um, the tradition that prioritizes instrumental reason. Um, 
and that that he thinks is critique is also a tradition, the tradition of the Aufklärung, of of the radical enlightenment in comparison to uh, Romanticism, and and that's where he's going to talk about the Exodus and the resurrection. So these uh, religious traditions, which also, um, I mean, all religions, the world's religions are most of them born. That's why it's called the Axial Age, in a period where. Um, the the injustices of the time are so pronounced and obvious that there is a reawakening, axial is moral or ethical, to to the ethical sphere, and a critique is made from that sphere. That's concretely how you um, uh, a recitation of acts of deliverance from the past. Um, you, you have an eschatology of freedom. Um, which is not anchored in some imaginative future realm, but is as anchored in tales of liberation um, from the past. Um, so each he ends up uh, has a privileged place, different regional preferences. On the one hand, an attention to cultural heritages, focused most decidedly perhaps in the theory of the text. On the other, a theory of institutions and phenomena of dominations focused on analysis of reification and alienation. Um, and, and he thinks both of these are essential uh, to our flourishing. Uh, but that there's no need to, to reconcile them. What we need is both a hermeneutics of, 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 of trust. We need, we need a place to stand within the traditions that we in, in, um, uh, uh, which organize our lives. But you also need a hermeneutics of suspicion. But that hermeneutics of suspicion will be anchored concretely in concrete analyses, which in fact are what Habermas has done. But, but contrary to what he claims, his analyses, his concrete analyses, are historical and conditioned. He's just um, pointing to different uh, trajectories of understanding which, from which to critique the present. But there's nothing he does that Gadamer can't affirm. Now, what he doesn't get, which he wants, and, and that's why this... Um, tension between them endured, I believe. What, he do, what Habermas doesn't get here that he wants is some sort, sort of point of reference uh, from which to legitimize what is good and what is just. And, um, and, and that's what he can't get. So after this, he actually seems to concede this point, and he writes a theory of communicative action. And there his argument um, is, is essentially that communication itself, when I talk to someone, uh, it presumes, when I, when I talk, basic uh, confidence in, and trust in um, uh, confidence in what the other person is saying is true um, and, and is saying is right. In other words, uh, built into communication itself are these fundamental sorts of ideas uh, which are uh, then can be worked out into a, a moral theory that's grounded in something uh, which is um, essential, which is the very structure of language itself, as something that depends upon um, uh, trust and truthfulness and things like that. Um, but but this has been unconvincing to people. There's no reason why should I obey that convention? Um, what why not be Mikey Avellian? Uh, why not? Uh, give ample air to ideals uh, which help to keep everyone else in line, even as I look to exploit them behind the scenes to my own advantage secretly um, as best I can. Um, so uh, in the end, uh, there is a passion for the good. Um, both of them, of course, are coming again out of the Holocaust. And so they, they, they both have different ways of condemning that as, as evil, but not ultimately any way to justify that condemnation. There's no way out of history. Um, and here you realize maybe, and I'm getting ahead of myself here, you, you know, all the, why these three interests? Why not another interest? Uh, these are three interests that are compatible with a uh, metaphysical naturalism. Um, with an idea uh, that we are within history uh, as something which has somehow epiphenomenal um, evolved out of a, a wholly material world, um, and 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 ultimately this is there's an ontological naturalism here that both participate in, uh, even if there's an affirmation of uh, free will which would defeat that to some uh, degree. So. Um, this is where neither of them are able to actually justify the appeals um, that they so desperately want. Um, Gadamer 
kind of questing after something as close as he can get is to uh, have the classical example, things that transcend their particular place and time. So somehow an eminent transcendence with history. Uh, Gadamer at this period projecting this ideal sphere of undistorted um, communication. It finds its parallel in English, by the way, in uh, Rawls's theory of justice and the notion that to, to make just decisions you, you adopt a veil of ignorance where you adopt the original position where you don't know who you are in a situation and then you judge what's fair if, if it turns out you might be any person. Well, that, that is an imaginative way to, to try to think of how I would judge fairly. It gets, it gets away from crass interests. But there's no way of imagining. And again, it presumes one can imagine oneself out of the whole understanding um, as if you're not carrying your very frames of re reference understandings which are historically mediated and uh, systemically distorted there's no way when you imagine that sphere um, and that veil of ignorance there's no way to think concretely without participating in the forms of thought um, which might be subject to systemic distortion and which themselves are giving to you as a product of the contingencies of history uh, so Rawls's uh, project is seen in that sense to fail as well as himself concedes when he writes a book later called Political, Li Political Liberalism, uh, in the same way Habermas's attempt failed. Habermas, too, is a going concern, um, even until recent years, still questing after that basis for making a moral judgment. And But that's where we get up to the present. There's not, I'm going to do Levinas, who's going to give a, one proposed answer to this, but um, uh, it's not commonly accepted. Um, this is why we have uh, still a crisis of foundation in ethics, a legitimization crisis in political theory, uh, questions over sovereignty, the debates over sovereignty, also in political and some lit crit theory. Um, there, there doesn't seem to be any place in the modern world uh, for the good, for a moral realism, and all of this seems to participate in that. Uh, that will be um, a key issue. And, and really remains the key issue. Uh, th that's what was lost. It's unrecognized often um, in the scientific revolution, re um, uh, revolution of the 17th century and the Enlightenment. It, it's not that suddenly the Earth wasn't the center of the cosmos. Um, that, that wasn't the point at all. It's that the cosmos itself was intrinsically morally ordered. What the modern turn, the scientific revolution and then the Enlightenment did was conceived of a world which is ultimately a brute fact. Uh, there's a distinction between physics and ethics, uh, between the natural and the human sciences and ethics. And now ethics can't find its place anywhere in the world. Um, and once that happens, and once history is something that happens in the world, then you have a displacement of ethics which yields all of these problematics. And there's going to be no way to undo that. Uh, without restoring an ethical dimension to the sphere of cosmology. But there, there's no consensus uh, at all. That, that's what my project of agape ethics and um, a theory of agape is about. It's following on Levinas, who in the same way is going to make um, ethics first philosophy. Uh, the effect of that is to give ethical claims as much status as any other sort of claim. In other words, he's putting ethics back into our fundamental vision of what's real in the world. That is the decisive move. It remains one which uh, is marginal in uh, modern Western thought and increasingly global thought among intellectual elites.